Well, good morning, and I'm very thankful everyone gets a little bit of a sugar high before the last presentations here. So enjoy the chocolates, and thanks, Ulrike. So again, I'm not from Turkey. I'm Peggy Staver with Pfizer from the US. And I appreciate the opportunity today to share with you uh, where we are with implementation of the US serialization and traceability law, referred to as the Drug Supply Chain Security Act. And I guess I should say, I, I'll just take a few minutes. I'm, I'm going to speak for about 10 minutes, and then Jeff Denton from Amerisource Bergen will take another 10. And if we have time, we'll have five minutes for questions. If we don't get to everything today, we have all afternoon today in a traceability session that I would welcome you all to attend, because we'll have plenty of opportunity for questions then. So thank you. So again, the US Drug Supply Chain Security Act, I refer to this as work in progress. We're in the first phase of implementation, and this law will be implemented between now and 2023, which sounds like a very long time frame, but based on what you've heard already today, that time passes very quickly, and we know that we have a lot of important work uh, yet to do ahead of us. So I'll review the requirements of the Drug Supply Chain Security Act at a very high level. We'll talk about where we are with our implementation and the next steps and then some questions. Um, so on November 27th of 2013, this law was signed into act. It's known as the Drug Quality and Security Act, but Title II of this bill is the Drug Supply Chain Security Act, which relates to pharmaceuticals. This law was the result of a collaborative effort between industry, our regulators, and our government, our legislators. So it was a, un a unique situation, actually, where industry approached the government to say, we need to do something in this area, and we want to be part of that discussion. So I think that, generally, it's safe to say we're pleased with the outcome here. That's not to say it's easy. It's a very complex law. And there are many uh, ambiguous parts to this law that we're still trying to figure out in working back and forth with the FDA and Congress. But again, no one stakeholder controlled everything that was part of this bill. So Congress had some things that were important to them, as did the FDA and the stakeholders. So I think that's where some of the complexity comes in. Um, so in terms of some of the key provisions, the first phase of this uh, we refer to as a lot level traceability system, if you will. And one of the things that we like about this bill, again, being a collaborative effort, is that we think it was reasonable. It had phased implementations. Uh, it had reasonable time frames for implementation. It supports the use of GS1 standards. So many of the things that we wanted to see as a community are addressed in this bill. The first phase of these requirements, and again, this is from a manufacturer's perspective, but there are requirements on all sectors in the supply chain here. But um, this is an important one for 2015. As of January 1st, this law required that for every change of ownership, for every unit that we sell in the US market, we must provide prior to or at the time of sale transaction information, transaction history, and a transaction statement. And as indicated here, this must be in a single document, which at this point can be paper or electronic. Going forward by 2017, it must be electronic. But right now, we're in this initial phase. And again, given that the law was passed in November of 2013, we basically had 13 months to put this solution in place. So admittedly, we kind of cobbled together a solution in a very short time frame, leveraging existing technology. So we're using advanced shipment notices, if, that, if you're familiar with advanced ship notices, we're using that technology to exchange this information today. We don't see that as the viable technology going forward once we get to item level traceability. We plan to migrate to EPCIS, which again, there's a whole session this afternoon where we'll talk more about that, so please come and learn more. But today we're using advanced ship shipment notices to exchange this information. <clears throat> the other point on this slide is that we have to capture and maintain the information that we're exchanging for each unit sold for six years. So if you can imagine, talk about the volume that Teva just mentioned and the volume that we have of product moving in the US market. This is certainly a big data kind of issue for all of us to address. And there's some other things that complicate this even further. So um, I tried to take the, I tried to, I hope I successfully took the US law and put it into three primary buckets of requirements <clears throat> in terms of key milestones. 2015, as I indicated, the product or lot level traceability 
environment. This environment today does not require any coding or any serialization. It does require us to take information that we already have and incorporate that into the transaction information history and statement documents. And I'll talk a little bit uh, on the next slide here in terms of what that means. We also have to have uh, systems and processes in place to be able to verify suspect and illegitimate product. And I'll share with you what that means from our, our law standpoint as well. And to respond to requests for information in 48 hours or less. And so again, back to the big data statement, it's not just that we have to capture information for six years, we have to be able to find information quickly to be able to respond to these requests. And then if we do in fact have an illegitimate product in the supply chain, we have less than 24 hours from one that is detected to notify the FDA and our trading partners that there is an issue. So a very short time frame there. The final point under 2015 relates to authorized trading partners. And that's an important requirement also because some of the issues that we've had in the U.S. market with counterfeit product is the result of product being purchased from sources that aren't legitimate. And so an authorized trading partner is one who is licensed or registered. And there's a database the FDA has put in place that can be used in the future to look to see if a wholesaler, for example, is appropriately licensed. And there's a process where you can verify if a manufacturer is registered with the FDA. So again, it's now a federal requirement that you ensure that your trading partners are, quote, authorized before you do business with them. And that is in place already. And then again, 2017 is the major milestone where we have to have a serialized number on every item that we sell. And there's some additional requirements that you can see here also. Um, and again, we have to maintain the information about that product identifier for six years. And then finally, in 2023, we have to be able to implement a full item level traceability system so that we can track and trace the product from the manufacturer through to the point of dispense, not to the consumer, but through to the point of dispense. So when I talked about transaction information that needs to be provided, here you can see what's included in the transaction information. It's basically the name of the drug, the strength, the dosage form, our national drug code, which is a national number, if you will. Uh, but again, because we're in support of GS1 standards, that national drug number can be incorporated into a GTIN, and that's what we're intending to do. And then you can see the other elements here in terms of container size, lot number, et cetera. Um, we also have to have in this transaction information who is selling the product and who is buying the product because a major requirement here is that for each change of ownership of the product, we need to, this information needs to be provided throughout the supply chain. And again, in the past, this might have been referred to as a pedigree-like document uh, where we're just trying to establish where the product has been in the supply chain and primarily for purposes of prosecution in the end if there is something that goes wrong. Um, and then the transaction history is basically a statement in paper or electronic form today that includes all the transaction information and a transaction statement that makes some declarations. And I'll show you what those are in a minute as well. Um, so for us here as a manufacturer, we have to provide this information not only to our immediate trading partner, in many situations it's manufacturer to distributor or directly to a dispenser, but also to some of our indirect trading partners in drop shipment situations. And we don't have time to get into what a drop ship is and how that works, but again, this afternoon, if you want to know more, I'd be happy to talk about that. But that creates some unique challenges because we don't have means today to electronically communicate with some of these indirect partners. So it's causing us to establish some new connectivity with trading partners that we haven't had in the past, and again, in a very short time frame. For us, there's just some statistics here in terms of the number of SKUs, very small compared to Teva in, in Europe, but uh, in the US we have about 1,450 SKUs. Uh, we have 22,000 trading partners that we have to establish this connectivity with and exchange information which, which is no insignificant challenge because unlike Europe, we are nowhere with establishing a central system or a hub system where we can exchange data. So this is point-to-point -point data exchange for the most part and it's, it's, uh, it has been very challenging. And then you can see information on shipments and deliveries. So I mentioned in my early remarks about suspect and illegitimate product. This is an important aspect of our law because what we're trying to do is identify, whoop, I'm sorry, I hit the button here. 
um, we're trying to identify as quickly as possible when we have an issue in the supply chain. So the law gave us definitions, broad definitions, for what suspect and illegitimate, illegitimate means. And for suspect, it, it says, we have a reason to believe that such product is potentially counterfeit, diverted, stolen, intentionally adulterated, such that the product could cause serious health, health consequences or death to humans, subject of a fraudulent transaction, or appears otherwise unfit for distribution. We have no idea what some of those things mean as an industry, and we've been working with the FDA to try to get clarification. So for example, what is a fraudulent transaction in the context of this law? What does otherwise unfit for distribution mean? It, I don't think it means something that, that got damaged in a warehouse. We have whole processes to deal with those type of products. So anyway, we're still working with the FDA for clarification on some of this. As I said earlier also, that this law was a collaborative effort of uh, a group of industry stakeholders. So when we first started, we were focused on counterfeit, diverted, and stolen product, for example. And these other areas were added in by other stakeholders who had an interest here. So that's where some of this is still fuzzy for us. And the unfortunate thing is, is that we have reporting requirements around them today. So if we don't know what it is, it's hard to report it. So we, we really are desperately seeking some clarification on some of this. Here's some key milestones for 2015 that we're looking at. Again, the uh, lot level traceability requirements became effective January 1st. Fortunately, the FDA recognized that we had some challenges, basically technical startup type issues in complying with the January 1st timeframe. So they used their enforcement discretion to allow us four more months to get our systems and processes and technical issues worked out. And that, that was very fortunate for us as an industry because we had many issues during that first four months of startup. So July 1st of this year, the dispenser requirements came into play, which were very similar to what I just showed for manufacturers. They have to receive transaction information history and statement for all the products that they're buying and maintain that information. So again, recognizing that there would be uh, challenges for the dispensers, the FDA again gave another four months of enforcement discretion. And that was uh, extended then the time frame to November 1st. So we're just about a week or so away from that right now, and we're anxiously anticipating what may happen. I think as I heard in the Europe uh, remarks earlier, we have some stakeholders who I think still don't know there's a law as of, November, as of January 1st, let alone being ready to comply November 1, and others who think they're ready, but once you go to implement, I think you realize that there are a number of other issues that you don't anticipate until you're actually live and in production. So we expect there will be some challenges come November 1st, but we'll work through those. Um, in terms of where we are with our implementation status, I feel that we've made significant progress to comply with the phase one requirements. We still have some important open questions, as I mentioned. Uh, I think the technical implementation issues are being addressed, and we will continue so as we get to that November one deadline for the dispensers. The product serialization efforts are well underway for 2017. But there's much work that remains for 2023 in defining the item level serialization traceability system. It's very vague in the law what the expectation is, and it's to be determined what the specific requirements are. One of my major concerns is the whole discussion we just had on the European Medicine Verification System. We have no central system that's being built, as far as we know, by the government. We have no stakeholder coalition that's come together and said, we will build this. So right now, we're looking at either a semi-centralized or a distributed system and the need to connect all these trading partners and exchange information and then be, be able to query that information to connect this history, if you will. So uh, a lot of work yet to be done, probably six to eight years of work. So when you look at where we're sitting today in 2023, you can see that time is quickly running out. Um, and in terms of next steps, I mentioned the, dis, uh, the enforcement discretion ending November 1st. Sorry again about that. Uh, we have the technical issues to resolve with the dispensers, open questions to address with the FDA. Uh, the FDA is developing some guidance documents for us, and we will and have had input into that process. Uh, we are preparing for the serialized, serialization and serialized item level data exchange, and we need to advance our efforts around where the data resides, the data architecture, and how it moves, the choreography. 
and we will we will conduct pilots. It is part of the requirement of the of the law actually that the FDA has to oversee some of the pilot work yet to be done. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff. And again, we have a lot of time later today for more questions. So thank you.